Hello and welcome to Latino Theater Company Live, another edition of Latino Theater Company Live. We hope that you have been enjoying our productions. If you have not watched them, you have a couple of hours left to see premeditation. It comes out of online at 11.59 p.m. We have Solitude, which goes all the way to September 3rd. And tomorrow we have our first online reading of August 29th. 29, there's a lot of dates. That's tomorrow, August 28th reading August 29th, directed by Alberto Barbosa, who we'll have here in our conversation. Visit our website, the latc.org, or our YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash Latino Theater Company Live. Today, we're going to be talking to Evelina Fernandez, Alberto Barbosa, and Rosalio Munoz, and hopefully Sal Lopez, if he joins us, if he's out there in the world. Sal, come on down. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about how historic events, how historic events, inspire art and storytelling, especially with our production of August 29th. Without further ado, here we go. Let's kick it off. Hello, hello. Hi, great to be here <laughs> with you guys. Hi. How's everyone Hi, doing? <laughs> You're muted, uh, Evelina. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Alberto. Hi, Evelina. Hi, Rosalio. Hi, Javi. How's it going? We're waiting. We're still waiting. Uh, I don't. Uh, we, we have one more guest, uh, Sal Lopez, who hopefully will be joining us. Um, we'll, we'll get in contact with him shortly. But um, let's go around the room, around the room, around the screen, <laughs> um, and introduce ourselves. I'm Javier Moreno, and I'm your host um, for tonight. And let's go over to my left, right. Uh, Rosalio, take it away. Okay, my name is Rosalio Munoz, and uh, back in uh, 1969, I had been student body president at UCLA, had uh, been active in the student movement, uh, an offshoot of uh, educational reform to have pass, non-pass, where you did, uh, so you didn't, and things you didn't know much about but were required wouldn't hurt your grade point. And we had professor evaluate all kinds of events to try to make the place more human. It was like a factory, it felt like. Um, but then the Chicano movement came up in 66, 67. And Uma started, my older brother, uh, who uh, had graduated in 65, was out in the community. And he started telling me about all kinds of things already happening, taking me to meetings. And then urging me when UMAS, the student movement, began to, to go. And I put that together with uh, in being in student government, was elected president, graduated. I had decided to go against, to go to court and fight the, the discrimination in the draft and the war. And lo and behold, I get drafted for September 16th. Wow. Yeah, the independent. <laughs> Mexican Independence Day, and I said, well, you know, being a student body president, being Chicano, refusing induction, and then add that, the other Guadalupe had enough symbolism to that if we organized with it could help move things forward. I talked to my good friend, an artist, and who had been my campaign manager at UCLA. Hey, why can't we see if we can build up our peace movement as part of the whole movement and help build the movement, uh, starting off with my refusing induction. And he said, are you willing to die? And I said, well, who knows what happened? We, I don't want to die, but I'm willing to go in there. He says, I don't. You'll be in the front. I'll be in the back. I'll be. But he was a good organizer and a good artist. And so I decided to uh, take on a kind of a persona to start moving about the country, working with my my friend who had worked with Cesar Chavez and the MAPA organization and other groups and see what we can do because uh, the war was killing us at two to three times the rate of the rest of the people in the country. African-Americans were facing the same thing. If you were cheap labor at home, you began became cannon fodder at home. Hmm. And uh, it worked, but that's enough for me. <laughs> There he is. For now. Yeah, there yeah. Is. For now. <laughs> yeah. 
See, that's, yeah. like, man, that's, oh, that's yeah. your activist story. <laughs> Sal Lopez. Yeah. Oh, ready. Uh, yeah, my name's Evelina Fernandez, and I'm a founding member of the Latino Theater Company. And we wrote a play uh, called August 29th in uh, 1990 to com commemorate the 20 year anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium and the death of uh, Ruben Salazar. And so in the process, and Sal was also part part of uh, the, we, we used to be called the, the Latino Lab back then. And um, so in the process of uh, creating the play, we interviewed several people. So we kind of decided we were gonna do this play in fact, Sal found the video the other day of when I was talking about my experience of that day, um, the day of the Chicano Moratorium. And um, so that was 30 years ago that, that, we, that we did the research, wrote the play. And one of the people that we, that we interviewed and who was so helpful to us was Rosalio Munoz. And um, he actually mm. is, a character in the play, um, so uh, which is kind of amazing that he's still here. He's still in the struggle. He's you know he's still in the movement. Work. It's you know it's amazing and you know it's um, a lifetime of activism. You know that is what Rosalio it has has. Uh, is this now. is this Rosalio right here? Let's see. Show, show it. Show it. Is that Rosalio right here? No, uh, let me see. Is it Rosalio? Let me see. Yeah, that is. Oh yeah, that's him. Oh, <laughs> no. That's the persona guy. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so anyway, uh, uh, that's all I'll say for now, yeah. Great. Um, Alberto, if you can uh, introduce us, introduce yourself and then, um, um, I guess in your part of your participation, you can take a little bit about the movement and also um, uh, about August 29th, tomorrow's reading. Right on. Uh, Alberto Barbosa grew up here in the city of Southgate, uh, Mexican immigrant parents from the state of Jalisco. Um, I was able to study at UCLA. I studied theater, film, and television there uh, back in the 90s, 90s into the 2000s. Evelina had a lot to do with me getting in. She wrote, she wrote a a letter of recommendation for grad school, right? Mm -hmm. And it was the best letter anyone's ever written for me, right? And I've had, you know, I've had some good people <laughs> write some letters for me, but this was <laughs> bad. And then, um, you know, I told her, well, I turned it in, you know, now we'll see what happens, right? She was, she was like, well, if you don't get in, let me know who's in charge of accepting people and I'll go kick their ass. <laughs> <laughs> so they knew better. That, that's what it worked. <laughs> let me in. So, anyways, I did my my graduate program there in the you know school of film, uh, school of theater, film and television. In 1995, uh, I started taking classes with Jose Luis in the theater department, and uh, I found out that there was a workshop happening at Plaza de la Raza. The Latino Theater Company was at Plaza de la Raza during that time. Um, they had been at the LATC for the 1990 uh, production of uh, August 29th, but now they were doing a production in the summer of 95. Prior mm -hmm. to the production, there was a workshop where Jose Luis was bringing 10 actors or theater artists from UCLA and 10 theater artists from East LA, because the intention was to bring, you know, to bring Raza together, right? And, you know, I, I never really uh, caught on to the rivalry between the universities that say USC or UCLA. I just felt like if, if you're able to get yourself to a university, like more power to you, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll all do, we'll all do mm -hmm. something good with our education, right? Um, mm -hmm. So anyways, in this particular case was bringing people from East LA and bringing people from UCLA. And that, that a workshop, you know, turned into, you know, a lifelong, you know, commitment to, mm -hmm. to theater really, you know? I mean, I, I'm still really good friends with not just the theater company, but with a lot of folks that were part of that, you know, um, part of that workshop, basically, right? Some of my oh. dearest friends were part of that workshop. You know, Ernesto Quintero was part of it. Uh, Rigo um, Jimenez, whose sister runs Plaza de la Raza. Um, Janelle, you know, who has a, a shop in Whittier. 
there were just so many of us. There was like 20 of us that were part of that, you know? So it was really, it, it, it was just really a great workshop to be a part of. And then that led into August 29th, right? So some of the actors from that workshop got cast as the chorus for August 29th. And then I came on as assistant director. So that was the first production I ever worked on with the Latino Theater Company. And then 25 wow. years later, um, I was I was uh, scheduled to direct the stage production for this fall. Oh, okay. But a pandemic came through and, and it, it turned it into a reading, right? So <laughs> uh, the last couple of weeks I've been working with an extremely talented cast, uh, putting together a reading uh, that will, you know, they'll present itself tomorrow. Awesome, thank you. So, thank you so much. Hey. So if you can um, introduce yourself and then just sort of your involvement in, um, in the company for those that don't know, and then a little bit about, um, I guess your involvement in August 29th also. Uh, well, I'm Sal Lopez and I've uh, been a member of the company, a founding member for over 30, over 30 years now. And uh, when we started doing August 29th, uh, the play, we did a lot of research. Enrique Castillo was part of, uh, was an actor who's part of the company as well back then. Uh, Angela Moya was in the part of the company, Julio Medina. And uh, it was a collaborative effort. Lupe Ontiveros, of course, Lupe Ontiveros. And it was a collaborative effort and we all did different things that, to contribute to, to, to this piece. But one of the main things that I was involved with, it was doing interviews with different uh, people from the Movimiento, uh, just people who were uh, around in that era, people who had been part of the, the march, people who were activists, uh, and also people that were involved with Ruben Salazar. I interviewed uh, his wife. Uh, um, uh, Restrepo, who was uh, was who was with him on on that day uh, wow. when he was killed at the Silver Dollar Hotel. I interviewed uh, Steve Weingarten, um, who was uh, a reporter, and uh, and uh, Lauren Lauren Miller Jr., who was uh, who was who was uh, became a judge but knew uh, Roven very well. And just a number of people, uh, Sal Castro, uh, and uh, it was it was you know some of these interviews. Uh, now that um, I've had time, I've been transferring them from VHS to digital and discovering these incredible gems that that I have, you know, and uh, with people who uh, either are no longer with us as well. And uh, so I I'm transferring all them, and hopefully we'll use them in our archives and uh, we'll, they'll be a resource for us to uh, have for the company. But in oh, terms definitely. of- the, Yeah, and I yeah, think yeah. We'll, we'll be, we, we might be able to share some. We, they're, um, we, uh, we, we, we uh, edited some to, um, to oh, they're cool. probably, they're not, they're not long so that we can yeah, definitely yeah, yeah, hear about. Yeah. So um, we'll definitely get to them um, in a couple of minutes. Um, I thought you had, uh, so I, I, I think one of the, the and, and getting started, I think one of the things, you know, and as we go into this conversation, you know, how, how historic events inspire art and, and, and storytelling, I think, you know, bringing in myself involved, you know, being born and raised in East LA, in the, in the, in the belly of the beast of where the movement was, right? Even to when I grew up, I, the only way that I learned about the movement and what was going on is through murals or through art. Um, and storytelling, right? And so what were some of the things that inspired, um, I think art has always been a part of the movement, right? So what were some of the things that, why, 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 why a play, right? Why um, this play, why go after these stories? What, what, was, was there, what was the inspiration behind it, if anybody? Well, we, we um, the Latino theater company, our, our roots are in the Chicano theater movement. Mm. So, um, Jose Luis and I worked with uh, Teatro de la Esperanza. I worked with Teatro Primavera, Teatro Urbano. Um, Jose Luis worked with Teatro de la Gente. And Sal and I were both in Zoot Suit with Luis Valdez. And then after we did Zoot Suit, uh, Sal went up and did several plays with the Teatro Campesino. Mm. So, you know, we have our, our roots are in the Chicano theater movement. And so when we started doing main stage plays at the LATC, you know, uh, that's 
those were our roots and that's what we wanted to do. And we've always done um, plays that, you know, deal with the issues that affect our community. And so that's been what we've done. That's been our mission and we continue to do it. We've been doing it for 30 years. Well, yeah. where, where was the, 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 the part, play first produced? Yeah, Rosalio. Yeah, I was just going to say um, we, we organized the moratorium uh, using art, using film, you know, mm -hmm. using paintings, using posters, using yeah. music. And yeah. the main organizer, I was a spokesperson, Ramses Noriega, it's an was an accomplished painter then and, and continues to be. So one of the oh. greatest pieces of art of the moratorium was the moratorium itself, because he guided it in a way that uh, we had the people playing the roles. Yeah. And, uh, and also he had posters or opening things. Our first march, we wanted to march in the barrio. We would go to the big marches. I spoke at one with Corky Dolores was an MC, but we didn't come out on TV like Lalo Guerrero sang about. We weren't there. <laughs> so everybody in the country, they saw the uh, David Hilliard of the Black Panther speaking and uh, Wayne Morris, a, you know, anti-war senator and some Indian chief with a war bonnet, but not one of us. So people were seeing them included. There was a half a million in New York, 250,000 in San Francisco where I spoke. And our people didn't get a message that we were part of it. So we had to have our own Chicano moratoriums. So at the first one, the Brown Berets called it. And it was just, we had to go down a back street on Michigan Avenue come from the monument there uh, to our, our uh, dead in, in uh, World War II in Korea and our Medals of Honor. But we had to go a back street. But in that, Ramses had a painting of a dying or dead soldier. And the Teatro the uh, Vida y Muerte from Long Beach that Lupe Saavedra led had a casket. So Ramses's painting of the dead person was there. And the message is, hey, folks, our kids are dying out there mm. in too many numbers. Two months later, we had another one pouring rain. People came out. Ramses did one of a casket in outer space, like from 2001. So the question mm. is, why is this happening? For August 29th, he put me, but it, 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 was, it could have been a Richard Cruz or Raul Ruiz. It was Chicano speaking out. And so that was kind of the answer to the question of what was that casket all about? It was about us, us having to organize and put an end to that. So, and then, you know, the, the singing groups, the at August 29th, just before the, the, the uh, sheriffs came in, you had uh, Folklorico from Church of the Epiphany with Father Luz and that it had been a birthplace for the walkouts and other things uh, years before. I know that years, uh, about 30 years later, we're at home I'm, uh, at a sit down dinner after church and it's about the moratorium. And my mom says, those little girls dancing were so beautiful. They were dressed so nice. They danced so well. The sheriff had no business coming into that part. So mm -hmm. it was, there was this art coming from it and that grew with it. And uh, so it was part of our heritage of the arts that our generation, a little bit young, took up and continued with. When was uh when was uh, the the August twenty ninth the, the play first presented? Our uh, first one was uh, was at LAPC, right? LAPC it was in nineteen ninety the twentieth anniversary. Right. Wow, and then so and then, all of the. Go ahead. Well. The, all the interviewing you, you did, Evelina yes. interviewed me uh, about things and you, the, yes. they took uh, edits of speeches. So I heard a little bit of mine, a little bit of David Sanchez, a little bit of Corky Gonzalez, and uh, more of Bert Corona, I think. Yeah, I have a lot of Bert. He was the one that, yeah. 
actually he put he's the one that really talked salazar into to doing more but um so all of that was so real and at at on the 25th anniversary there in, in plaza de la raza there was film there was loud music and they showed this classic picture of at the riot not the riot at the attack when the, the, the sheriff came up behind a chicana and bashed her on the head and knocked her down well right in the front row this woman young there woman we, gets up Evelyn. and says that's my aunt and she <laughs> faints it was so realistic it, it was it, it, wow we said i hope she's all right <laughs> but anyway, Evelina, you're muted that's, a, that's how that's, great it was that's a dramatic moment yeah in the play too it's very dramatic mm -hmm. Well, yeah. so a, lo a, a lot of these were interviews, but was some of it, you know, uh, for anyone, a, a memory, like, I mean, uh, things that you remembered as well, or, or oh, and it was, cause this was one of the first, the first like this was written collaboratively by the company, right? Yeah. Well, it, was, it, it was, it was started out collaboratively, but it ultimately it ended up uh, Evelina and Enrique Castillo Doing, doing the well, writing because it well, but, the, but there's still scenes in the play that were written, like say Lupe, scenes that were written by mm -hmm. Angela, they're still in there. You know, I think what happened is yeah. uh, we shaped it, right? We shaped mm -hmm. it, right. but right. we did all the research together. We all wrote scenes together and then we shaped it. And then wow. uh, back then, you know, back then there weren't any Latino um, scenes. Uh, set designers, right? Right. And so um, uh, Jose Luis reached out to Gronk because right. you know, he had the mural over there at uh, Estrada Courts. And so um, so in the first, the 1990 version, uh, we, we had a more of a budget than when we were Plaza de la Raza, but there were a lot of images, you know, that were, um, uh, curated by Gronk, uh, mm. you know, for the play. Yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing about the play back then, and it's going to be interesting to know how what the impact is now, so many years later. I mean, yeah. we haven't done it since 1995, right? So I, I think the interesting um, outcome of the play back then was that uh, people would come out sobbing, in the lobby of the LATC and just say, I need a shot of tequila. <laughs> be, be, because um, I think a lot of people felt, you know, that they, you know, really did become, you know, less active. You know, there was a certain apathy in the community at the time, you know, the movement was, you know, nowhere anymore, even the, even the Chicano theater movement had dwindled down to just a few teatros, you know, all of that. So it had a profound effect on the community in Los Angeles, for sure. Wow. Well, I'd like to add that the, the characterization and the acting of Ruben Salazar reminded me of him. During the, I had talked to him, he'd interviewed me at when I first refused induction, we complained about to the times that they didn't adequately talk about what we were going out to do. And so Ruben hadn't been in town. He came, but they called him on the phone. You know, a Chicano comes and complains, so I'll put the Mexican there to talk to him. <laughs> and he says, look, I wasn't there. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't tell this other reporter what to do, but if you continue to do what you say, you'll get coverage, and he did, and he found ingenious ways of doing it. So when I'm walking down Whittier Boulevard, just past the, right by Eastern, just past the Long Beach Freeway over uh, mm -hmm. a bridge or uh, mm -hmm. overpass, I, there he comes up to me and gives me the biggest abrazo. He said, Rosalio, you guys did it. And I, it was, there was so much Mexicanismo and, and Chicanidad and what he was expressing at the joy of seeing our people rise, because he was against the war and had been for a while. 
that was when I saw the portrayal of him on the stage, his humanity, his insight, his caring, but his also knowing reality that was projected there. That was the man that gave me that big hug. Well, the other wow. part of it is that we, um, we got to know his, his wife, Sally Salazar, you know, because we wanted to know, I mean, there was, Ruben Salazar, the journalist, and then there was Ruben Salazar, who was married to a white woman and lived in Orange County, you know? <laughs> that was the other side of who he was, right? Right. And we addressed that a little bit in, in the play, but it was it was so wonderful, wasn't it, Sal, to get to know Sally, his wife, and just get her point, her point of view to kind of flesh out who that man was you know, as a human being. And we became friends for, for, for many, many years. And in fact, when she passed away, they asked uh, us to be there and also for Sal to speak at her yeah. services. And yeah. his daughter, uh, Sal, uh, the, Sally's daughter. Wow. Lisa, also, Lisa Salazar. Lisa, Lisa. She came, I think, I know she came to one of the performances, right? Well, uh, well, they both came. She to was there at 95, yeah. Yeah, and Lisa um, was there in 95. Right, right, in 95. Thank you, yes. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was interesting because, uh, you know, like in the play, the, he, the characters drink tequila, but in real life, he liked screwdrivers. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, Peg and, and Peggy Lee, you know, he, he used to listen to Peggy Lee. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, that was another side that, uh, uh, you know, we got to hear the humanity, as you were saying, Rosalio, you know, in, in the, the type of person that he was. And, uh, and you get that from the interviews. You get that from, from Lauren Miller and, and others. Yeah, and I and he used to go to a bar. What was it called, Sal? The, uh, the, the, I think it was the Red Red something. Red Robin or the Red yeah. something. And I don't know how was, many how many people we interviewed that said, "Yeah, we used to go out for drinks, and we used to go out for drinks, and we used to go out for drinks." And we're like, "Man, oh, <laughs> drank with Ruben Salazar. Shoot, <laughs> yeah, he drank a lot." <laughs> oh, the Red Rooster. Oh, the, the Red, Red Rooster. Yeah. yeah, and that actually, the Red Rooster yeah, became Eastside Love uh, in Boyle Heights. Yeah. Uh, there you oh. go. <laughs> yeah. See, I wanted to add a little bit of the re realism too, because uh, one of the key parts of the play was uh, when Ruben finally gets uh, the professor uh, speaking, the young woman professor. Uh, and real uh, thinking back about what happened, a very dramatic part of it was it turns out that her boyfriend was an infiltrator. Mm -hmm. And that had ruined, that had made her into a Chicana professional without the, the sentimiento, without the ganas. Mm. But realizing that, that reality that they came to undermine us, and they did undermine a lot of people, it did misdirect a lot of things and uh, something that we still need to think about about how injurious the that was and how widespread it was and how long it lasted mm -hmm. but that we can talk about another time but that is a real reality that we had to deal with and that play brought it out uh, in a very realistic way and showed that well yeah we have some hang-ups from all of that but we can overcome them if we take the spirit of the movement, like Ruben Salazar. We can we can overcome. He was yeah. appropriately the character in the play is appropriately named Benny, and he named him Benny after Benedict Ar Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. That's how you got it. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Alberto, oh, you said you mentioned um, you got to uh, work or develop it. Were you a, a part of the play as an actor or just? Um, no, it was, a, it was the first play I started uh, working as assistant director with Jose Luis. Wow. So and prior, was that to that, prior to that, I wanted to be an actor, right? And then when he took me on as a mentee, 
He's like, all right, we'll stop acting then if you want. To. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and I kept to it. I've never gone back to acting since then. Wow. Yeah. And, and so, so since, since, since that time, it's never been presented since after that or not, not by the Latino theater company. I've seen, there was a Chicano theater classic festival at UCLA back okay. in the early 2000s, I think. Um, and there was one of the universities presented it there. I remember that. I think mm -hmm. it must have, might have been CSUN or San Diego. I forget which which university did. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure there's been See? some colleges or some universities that have done it, but a it professional, like a professional production like the LTC, I haven't seen. There hasn't been one since '95. Wow. There was one at a little what? gossip 101. Of, I don't know how many years back, yeah. but yeah, mm -hmm. they did it there. It was about right. 2003 or four. It was about 2003 or four. Maria M Martinez mm -hmm. got me to go kind of talk what it was like back then for the past. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're on first street. Wow. Cool. Mm -hmm. What, what, so one of the, I mean, the interesting things is like, so back, I mean, we keep talking about this in the conversations, right? Is that we, we were producing these plays for the stage and now producing them um, on the screen, right? And then like, you know, even even like uh, one of the, the interesting things of like Ruben Salazar, he was writing for the paper. Um, I think he also worked for Univision for a while, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Channel 34. Yeah. Channel 34, yeah, I think yeah. Univision. Um, yeah, what's, what, uh, was and this is- He was the news director of Channel 34. Mm -hmm. KMEX. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is gonna be, yeah tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be one of our our first um, online readings. Um, uh, going to be, it's, and it's been a, uh, I mean, with everything that we've been doing, trying to push online. I mean, it's a it's a lot of a lot of work. But I think one of the the things that we've been seeing, even just with these conversations, is the um, uh, the want and the need for pe that the people want mean to watch it and see it. We've been getting emails and social media. And especially right now with the the youth, right, that are at home, um, um, as I was even mentioning, I had a like, I, I didn't, I went to school all throughout East LA. I never got, I didn't learn it in the classroom. I learned it outside of the classroom. Um, so I think it's be, for teachers that want to watch this uh, and to learn the history, it's going to be free um, on our website and YouTube page. And it goes, I think, all the way until... I want to say, yeah, uh, September six, so you can watch it on demand um, anytime. Let's go. Um, let's go with one of the videos with uh, an interview with Sal Castro, really quick, and then we'll we'll jump back on right here. Here we go. Interesting part of the whole event was it when in '64 when he wrote the story, I met him, and so was on Red. Soon, soon after that, he became the the the. Uh, the uh, he, he became the chief of the desk in Mexico City. He left L.A. and he went for several years to Mexico City. He comes back after the walkouts. And then he says, hey, man, there's a big change. Something's happened, you know, because not they didn't know what was going on, had, had been going on up here. Although people say that the kids that that uh, did their thing at the Loco in October of 68, oh, wow. the Chicanos, had and were inspired somewhat to what to what the kids were trying to do here. That I can't verify. I, I think like, well, there was a very strange Man, you guys were all Chicano. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I I used to have a heavier Chicana accent. <laughs> it is. <laughs> is that is that Sal Sal? Who, who, is that you and Nevelina there? Who, who was interviewing? Yeah, so I think it's me and uh, it was several of us. I think it was Jose Luis as well. I don't mm -hmm. remember. There was, a, there was a handful of us in that office, I think, that day. Yeah, Sal Castro has passed away. It, well, I don't know how many years ago, but, uh, you know, it passed this country. So, Alberto, what was it like? How approaching this, this old play? I mean... <laughs> I think about it now, and I think it's like a it's it's a period, kind of like an old old place. So what was it like approaching it, or how was the language? Yeah. How did how does it resonate? Does it still hold up? I guess that's my question. Well, I guess we'll find out, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out tomorrow. 
Um, <laughs> no, I, I think just by the work that, that the actors did and I did, uh, I mean, we know that it does because we were completely and totally engaged with it. Um, it's, I mean, it's a trip, you know, it's a trip. It's a, it's a woman who's, who's going through an existential crisis and she's conjuring up the ghost of the person that she's writing about. And she has a really long conversation with him. Mm, you, know? <laughs> but, you know, aside aside from that, aside from the, just that idea of like, okay, so how 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 do how do you even wrap your head around the fact that someone has to conjure someone and then have this conversation with them, right? So just starting there, right? And then what does that even mean? What does it mean to talk to ghosts? What does it mean to you know, and, and, you know, obviously as, as you get older, you talk to more and more ghosts in your life, you know? Um, so yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and aside from it being a period piece, right. Set in 1990, about 1970, it's about family, right. Mm -hmm. It really centers around young Lucero, her mom and her dad and, and how they were at odds with what was happening and, and their brother and their brother, right. Like the, the, I, I realize, right? Like, yeah, it's about Ruben, who's a ghost, but the brother plays such a big part in it, and he's never on screen, right? He doesn't, he doesn't have one line in the play, yet you feel him, right? Because, because the uh, family feels him so much, right? Mm. So you'll see. I mean, the performances that you know Lucy Rodriguez did as the mom, and Alicia Coca, you know, playing young Lucero, and Jeff playing oh. father. And you know, and it's a full circle, right? I mean, so so going back to, does it still hold? Of course, I mean, of course, it still holds. You know, it's 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 not just about a person. It's about a it's about a community. It's about a family, and and hearing you talk about how people were feeling in the '90s about the '70s, it sounds like there's a little bit of PTSD, right, mm -hmm. from, <laughs> from what happened in the '70s. But the thing is, though, like I, I'm someone that grew up in the 90s, right? So in the 90s, you know, I got involved with Metra at UCLA. We were, you know, marching and rallying against Prop 187, anti-immigrant, you know, policy, Prop 209, anti-bilingual education, or no, Prop 209 was anti-affirmative action. And then Prop 227 was anti-bilingual, right? So all those things were happening again in the 90s. And now we had crack cocaine and AIDS. You know, hmm. uh, we had all this stuff going on. So recently I met up with a UCLA alumni friend of mine, fellow filmmaker, and he brought it up. He's like, man, you know, I think everyone, our generation that grew up in the 90s has a little bit of PTSD, hmm. right? Just because of that, right? Because we grew up in a time where drive-by shootings were like something that was common. You know what I'm saying? So, so to so now, like now, working with Zila, right, at Lucero, she grew up in the '90s, right? And there's that section where Lucero talks about, "Oh, you want to know what's going on? This is what's going on, right?" So then, Zila and I were working that stuff out, and I said, "Look, look, Zila, you know, I, I'm, you know, from the '90s, and she's so, so am I." She goes, it's been really difficult for me to say these things because that's what happened to me. You know, that's mm. what happened to my family. I, well, lost, I lost so many people in the 90s. But, you know, we get anesthetized by the mass culture that's manipulated by the publishers, by all of these things that we have to fight our way through. And that's the value of the art. One of the things that brought us back, and I don't know how you're going to deal with it or if you do in the in the reading was when uh, Stella comes back and he's trying to relate to the times the actress was was uh, living in and he asked, well, who's president now? <laughs> and then they tell him, Ronald Reagan. And everybody, and he's just so shocked. That guy yeah. had to be president. You know? <laughs> it wouldn't go on the same way. But so maybe you ought to put Trump up there. But anyway, <laughs> the, challenge, the challenge of doing that uh, that broke through, just like getting the baton on the head mm -hmm. broke through about mm -hmm. what it was all about, learning about the, the infiltrator uh, Benedict. Then uh, uh, all of those things brought a whole lot of things back because, hey, all of us from the 70s and 60s, we were in there fighting 187, uh, you know, uh, following up. Uh, 
Maxine Waters on the drugs and all these other things. And we got rid of Chief Gates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How yeah. is, how, I, I, I think one of the interesting things is, you know, it's we're, go, we're celebrating these 50 years of the Chicano Moratorium with August 29 and dealing with the pandemic, uh, dealing with police shootings, protests, I mean, hurricanes, a presidential election. What is something that, you know, um, you hope or I guess uh, yeah, hope um, or or as advice for those storytellers of the future that are gonna write today's story for the for the stage or screen in future generations. I mean, what what's like the advice of of, of documentation and and storytelling? Well, tell Anyone. them to vote right now because we need to start <laughs> voting. Get those stories out. Why we need to vote this this fall? Yeah, for sure. Um, well. And before I forget, um, Rosalio and I uh, have been part of the 50th anniversary Chicano Moratorium Committee. Um, so we've been planning for this August 29th since before mm -hmm. the pandemic. We actually used to have in-person meetings. And um, so this August 29th, Saturday, the, we planned a caravan so people can stay safe because of COVID-19. So the caravan starts, people are going to gather on um, on Whittier Boulevard and what's the other street, Rosalio? Scott. Scott. And Scott. Scott. In, in Pico yeah, Rivera. Yeah. Just off yeah. the freeway to the right, west. Yeah. Right close to the 605. And then we're going to caravan down Whittier, Boul Whittier Boulevard all the way to Salazar Park. So people can stay safe. They're not exposed, you know, to um, any of the pandemic, but it would be wonderful if everybody just got out there and, um, you know, showed uh, their uh, desire to commemorate the Chicano Moratorium and uh, and Ruben Salazar. Yeah, definitely. Um, but just want to remind those that are watching, if you have a question, please, please for any of the uh, panelists here, participants come, um, Type it in the comment sections and we'll try to answer in a couple minutes. But just to remind you also that tomorrow, starting tomorrow um, at 7 p.m., you can screen on demand August 29th all the way to September 6th. You can watch it anytime, any hour from uh, from tomorrow night till September 6th, 2020 at youtube.com forward slash Latino Theater Company or by visiting our website, the latc.org forward slash live. You can pause it and then restart it again um, and watch it whenever you want. So if you have any questions, uh, please join us and, and let's continue having this conversation. Uh, if anybody wanted to answer that of, 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 of continuing that storytelling um, for, for the future, how do, how do we continue that? Well, one thing I do know is that we have so many stories that haven't been told, right? And that's, yeah. that's where, um, the arts come in, I believe, because we're really the the doc the documentarians of our history, right? It's not, it's an oral history. It's a history that it, that doesn't get told. You know, it doesn't get told on the, the main stages. It doesn't get told, you know, in the fine arts museums. It doesn't get told in film and television. It they do, but it's so rare so rare you know that we ever get to tell our stories in a significant way so i feel like you know, I, I would say to young people you know tell the story you know, tell our story if we don't tell our stories our stories are not going to get told and everybody has your family history everybody mm -hmm. has your own you know story of what how you you know developed as a as an individual and those stories, if you look at the at the American narrative, were like Rosalio said, you know how they didn't show them when they were in Washington. The same thing is happening right now. Generations and generations of stories are not being told. And so it's it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to make sure that those stories are told. Yeah. You know, one story 
part of our story is that we helped end that Vietnam War. They call it the, the, the Vietnam Syndrome was that the American people turned against that war and in the end our soldiers wouldn't fight and would turn on their officers. So no matter how many bombs they dropped, they didn't have anybody, they didn't have enough on the ground. We took away their cannon fodder. So that's one story we don't relate it so much to one of the reasons we fought it, which was that war, and we were able to do that. But, um, you know, we have to look at the COVID, what I was just thinking with that related to the smallpox that we weren't able to keep, didn't know about it, uh, able to deal with. And that the COVID, we've got to find a way, of course, to really get the, the, the medicines and get the treatments eventually to do it. But uh, the struggle that we're having is also historic, along with the problems with the White House that add to all of that. How we're dealing with the pandemic is something that hopefully we'll be able to tell that story for centuries. Yeah, because um, our community is being hit hard. I mean, the majority of deaths in LA County alone are Lati Latinos. You know, that the majority of deaths and cases are Latinos. I mean, obviously because, you know, we're a majority of the population, but our, 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 if you look at, I mean, I don't know if you guys do this, but I go on the LA County thing almost every day to see mm. what the cases are. And the highest cases are in Pico Rivera, East LA. You know, it's, it's like, it's, it's, those are people who have uh, jobs that, that they're essential workers, you know, they have to go to work. And these are the people that are being the most affected by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that is. So is anybody going to tell that story? Because if we don't tell it, it's not going to get told, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is there is there um, uh, a hope that August 29th it can be presented on stage next year or when we're allowed to? Absolutely, that's the plan. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, awesome. the plan is even though we weren't able to do the production for. The 50 year anniversary we we still plan on doing the play um when when we're able to open the theater yeah yeah again if you have a question please type it in the comments and we'll try to answer it um as uh, evelina and rosalio mentioned there's a uh, march caravan this saturday uh tune in tomorrow for our first online reading you can also watch solitude and premeditation which ends tonight we have la olla and another um movement related play the last angry brown hat um is going to be sh uh that's going to be next week it's um online reading as well so um stay in contact with us we also have conversations um and so much more i'm excited i i i um i think we i we went i think in high school or no uh middle school or something like that um, <laughs> oh, <kindergarten. laughs> um uh, I had a, a, a teacher who was like deep involved in the movement at at, uh, at elementary school. And then I had him again in high, in middle school and it was really cool, Mr. Carmona. And I remember we used to, we used to he used to start the class with um, Los Lobos and like, I was like, what the hell is this thing? And if it wasn't for him, I mean, like we would, I mean, he'd take us, we did a tour from, from I went to Belvedere, we went down row one and like just looking at spots and we're like, what the hell, is, what is this going on? You know, it's like, but that's like for me, I mean, I think for a lot of the stuff, I mean, just what I was talking to Rosario earlier, just three days ago, LAUSD signed um, for the ethnic studies for LAUSD. I mean, I, I graduate, I graduated more than 10 years ago, high school, but these things have, are still not in these on the on in the history books, um, and so like you learn it through one of the things like you learn it through plays or these movies or um, for me a lot a big part was murals and we're like who is this guy pointing at me right especially mm -hmm. this mural in a background by Gronk right like I used to pass by it so many times growing up my grandmother lived there I used to be like what 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 is this like what does it mean you know what I mean. So it's, 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 you look it up, right? Back in the days, encyclopedia, or you go to the library. Um, and then beyond that, it became theater. So I'm excited about that. 
um, to see it tomorrow and to learn more about it. The other thing I wanted to mention about um, the play is that a lot of my family story is in the play. So Ooh. when you hear you know, them talk about all the cop cars that are parked at Rowan Avenue, that's what we saw. We're like, what mm. are all those cop cars doing at, at Rowan Avenue? We had no idea yeah. why there were hundreds of cop cars parked on the playground, uh, you know, on wow. uh, Avenue. And then the other part of it is um, my brother was in Vietnam. You know, my brother Hank was in Vietnam and, and luckily he made it back, but it was a traumatic experience for us to not know whether he was going to make it back. Yeah. The the scene where where uh, she says, "I never heard a scream like that," you know, in my life, is because our neighbor's son was killed in Vietnam, and and that happened, you know, that we heard this scream from this woman when she found out that her son died in Vietnam. It was just heartbreaking. And so that's why we put it in the play. Yeah. Wow. You know, you know, one of my favorite photos, actually it was in the, the big march that we had before the 29th, February 28th in pouring rain. And one mother was carrying the sign, Yo quiero hijos. No heroes. Mm. And it was those daily, the mothers wanting the sons back. Because we had no business over there. And mm -hmm. uh, that was really the major force. Uh, there was organizing, there were groups and everything, but the social force that was the strongest was the women of our community that brought, that got us to look at the realities and that we had to do something about it. Yeah, and the and Vietnam. Was, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and the go Vietnam ahead. War was the first war that was really televised, right? So that w had a, a, you know, profound effect on the country. You know that now, that's forbidden. Do you know that now you don't see the 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 coffins coming back from, you know, when they're killed, that doesn't happen anymore. And there's a reason for it. Because when we were able to see the carnage of Vietnam, the whole country uh, turned against that war. But yeah. the war since then, you're not, you're not allowed to see any of that anymore. So, you know, then it seems so distant. It seems like it's not happening, you know, unless right. you're immediately affected. But that had a lot to do with why the country turned against that war. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a, a question here from uh, Veronica Roman. It says, um, how do we humanize Chicanos, Chicanas and Chicanos for those who still don't know us? How can we use theater to teach a better understanding of us as a diaspora and foster knowledge of self? anybody well I, I think the I mean this reading is is a good like uh, primer um, I mean the opening monologue is Ruben's uh, essay about who is a Chicano and what is a Chicano mm. want right so that's how it starts and and that's the discourse throughout uh, and the conflict the inner conflict uh, particularly to for folks that start climbing up the social ladder or start developing professional field, you know, start developing themselves in their professional field. Um, how, how much can they contribute? You know, how involved they are. Um, you know, this piece is, is not just about the moratorium itself, right? Like it's about what's happening in 1990 as well. Um, mm -hmm. And what's happening now, right? So, what was happening in 1970 is that there was a Chicano moratorium that was brutally uh, attacked by the sheriffs and the police officers in the city of LA. Uh, fortunately, well, yeah, by, by fortunately, there was a, a handful of uh, filmmakers and photographers that were Chicanos mm -hmm. and Chicanos documenting the day, right? Mm -hmm. But that's common now. That was not common then, right? So. In order to find out if someone was killed by a cop 
um, you know, unjustly, right? Mm -hmm. You'd have to have someone like Ruben Salazar who would put themselves out on the line to write an article about it. Now, you know, because everyone has cell phones, you can document someone's killing and stream it live, right? Which is a really sad reality to be in, right? Um, but, but this, you know, those things are happening now. They're happening now, right? People are taking mm -hmm. to the streets. People are protesting the killing of people by, by police officers and by sheriffs, not just in, you know, Wisconsin, not just in Minnesota, not just in LA, but throughout this country, right? So I think in addition to being a historical piece, it's, it's a piece, you know, it's a piece that can really have a, a, a deep dialogue about fundamental issues we have, right? Because this has been going on for over 50 years. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to sign yeah. off because I have another interview at 8. Oh, that's right. <laughs> really, <laughs> really so much, part of this and, uh, Looking forward to seeing it on, uh, when is it? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Tomorrow. yes. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah. Bye, Sal. Bye. Um, I guess to answer Veronica's question is that um, how do we humanize uh, Chicanos and Chicanos to those who don't know us? Um, we have to keep telling our stories. That's the only way. We just have to keep telling our stories, keep reminding people of our contributions to, you know, this country that, that you know, we've died in every single war you know, that we continue to, you know, um, enlist and they continue to want us to enlist, right? Yeah. And um, so um, I, I guess that's the only thing you can do. I mean, uh, at us as artists, I'm talking in particular. Yeah. Well, yeah. that is it for tonight. Thank you so much, Rosalio, Alberto, Evelina, Sal. Thank you, Javi. Uh, and everybody that joined us, we had a, a great number of audience members. Remember um, to watch August 29th on demand starting tomorrow, Friday, August 28th to Sunday, September 6, 2020. It's free. Teachers, if you're out there, just play it <laughs> uh, for your students. Um, online theater, you know, we're doing it. So um, visit our what website. Uh, it starts tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, on our website, but you uh, but you can watch it after that at any time you want. Yeah, be live. Okay. and we'll see you all on August 29th for the caravan on, for the Chicano Marshal. Yeah, it's a beautiful mural at the end that they're going to reveal. So go check it out. Thank you so much, and we'll see Bye. you next time. Bye. Okay, thank you so much.